Winged humanoid beings, creatures, are seen all over the world, from the Mothman of Mount Pleasant to the Owlman of Mornan here in England. The witnesses to these strange beings struggle to understand what they're seeing or to explain it to somebody else. Because like Bigfoot and Dogman creatures, the descriptions vary. There's no set template for a humanoid creature. Some are described as bird-like, with feathered wings. Others have leather wings, more like the wings of a bat. Some have snouts like dogs and others have beaks. The eye colour ranges from jet black to scarlet red, with a myriad of colour in between. There are reports of these impossible beings jumping the height of a bridge with one jump, or with one flap of their wings. You'd be hard pushed to be believed after experiencing these horrors of dread in the US, let alone in the UK. But people here see them and report them. Even with the fear of being falsely accused of being a fraud or a liar, people make the reports because they're so disturbed by the incident and what happened to them. The worry and confusion eventually outweighs the fear. What I found strange when I was putting this together, very strange really, was that two of the events happened in 2009, although they were quite far apart, and another two happened in 2006. Is this a strange coincidence, perhaps, or something that's not been picked up on before? I don't know. It's one of the reasons I like to put lots of sighting reports together in one place. It kind of exposes any suggested patterns in years, on weather, months, season, description of the creature scene, or even the witness themselves and what they were doing at the time. On Fridays, I like to tune in to Paul's channel, Truth Proof, on uh, YouTube, Paul Sinclair. And he usually has a chat box running, like we do on our Tuesday live feed. And I'm often in there because I find it fun. I like to listen to him. So one chap that was in there reached out to me. He was named Roland. And he said, hi, Deborah. I've just watched the latest Paul Sinclair live stream. And I saw you in the chat. And I thought that it was about time... I told someone about one of the strangest experiences that ever happened in my life to someone who will not laugh or disbelieve what I have to say. I live on the island of Jersey and I have done so since I was 18. That was back in 1990. And in that time, I've seen a couple of strange things. I once saw a golden basketball-sized sphere that was floating up a valley against the prevailing wind And on another occasion, there was a mechanical device of some sort that was above my car, emitting the strangest sound and motion, but nothing that compares to the incident I had one late summer's eve in 2009. I must preface this account to state that I was brought up in the countryside. I lived on a farm, my family having three farms in rural Northumberland. So I'm well versed with our countryside and wildlife, both domestic or wild, and the behaviour and sounds of the animals in all of their modes and states, being distressed, hungry or something else. This night was hot, summer's late evening, it was mid-August 2009. It was around 10, 10 10.30, and I was sitting near an open second floor window of a beautiful barn conversion, that was part of a rural farm that had recently been developed into high-end living. Being it was in the countryside, it was very peaceful and quiet, especially at that time of night. I don't know how long I was listening, but I suddenly became aware of a dog or a dog sparking in distress. I got up, I put my head out the window and I looked to my left, where the sound was coming from which was behind a thicket of trees about 80-odd feet to my left. Then I saw this thing just rise up, vertically, without any motion of any wings, and it rose to a similar height that I was at, about 10 feet above the top of the trees, which would be around 60 feet in all. This thing just looked like a dirty, yellow, white, dirty, creamish mass of something. It then became absolutely silent. No sound 
of any sort. The dogs had stopped barking and there was just this unreal silence that I'd never experienced before. It then beat its wings once and was suddenly level with me. It travelled the 80-odd feet in one flap of its wings and was now about 15 feet away from my head, presenting its full profile. I couldn't understand how it travelled that far with just one flap of its wings. Its head reminded me of a seal's and there was the size of a very large dog's head, but it had a beak like a puffin or a parrot, which was black. Its eyes were just pools of black and I did not want to look into them. It was just hanging there in midair. It actually stopped with no movement, just back and forth. I then became aware of its wings, which were going up again. And that's when I saw that they were like leather and it gave one flap and it was gone. Its wings were about eight feet long each and they made a swooshing sound as they moved. I looked after it and it had travelled an impossible distance again with just one flap of the wings. And then that was that. It was gone from my line of sight. I didn't get a good look at the rest of the body. It's, it was just head, beak, eyes, wings, and then it was gone. One of the crazy things is, my partner at the time was no more than 10 feet away from me when this took place. I didn't shout for her to come and look. I didn't even tell her about it afterwards, or since. I found myself questioning myself over this incident, questioning my own state of mind, my own sanity. I cannot, couldn't comprehend what it was that I'd seen. Many a time, even years later, I'd find myself looking up and in trees when I'd been alone in the countryside, walking and driving or whatever, and thinking that this thing could be right there now and you'd have no idea. It's not like I live in some wilderness. Where I am is only a small island. It's just nine miles by five. The other strange thing was the effect that this event seemed to have on time. I don't know how to ascribe the correct words that would do justice to this effect, that would enable you to have a good understanding of what and how it felt. Something really strange happened to time, whatever that might be. As you can imagine, I've thought a lot about that night since it happened, wondering what in the world could that animal be? Is it a leftover, an animal that's very, very old and somehow has survived in a small pocket somewhere? Is it a modern-day hybrid of some sort, from some lab, a genetic Frankenstein that's escaped or been turned loose? I don't know. But what I am coming around to believing now is that it has to be interdimensional. It broke the laws of our physics. It displayed anti-gravity type behaviour when it was just hanging in the air. When it travelled a distance it did with just one flap of its wings, an impossible distance, as if behaving by our law of physics. So it sits with me well to say that it is probably interdimensional. The only other thing that sits with me well is the conclusion that has come to me that this thing was demonic in nature. There was absolutely nothing with this creature and the experience of seeing it that was screamed out any love and light. I was afraid to look into its eyes. I don't know why. But when it was ha happening, there was a voice saying to me, don't look in its eyes, don't look in its eyes. Its whole appearance, the colour, etc., Everything about it just had a very negative vibe. Well, that's about it. And this is a truthful account of what I saw and felt on that August evening in 2009. Feel free to use this account for your work, Deborah, if you feel the need. Many thanks for taking the time to read this. Kindest regards, Roland. On hearing from Roland and the events of that night, I was reminded of another strange report here in the UK. It didn't take place in Jersey, but it features a very unusual creature that had wings that were leathery and the face of a monkey with a beak. And I'm not saying that this is what Roland saw. I'm just stating 
that this was another strange be winged being that was seen in the UK. And it was called the bat-winged monkey bird. Now, the bat-winged monkey bird is described as an animal that stood about three feet in height and it had the wings of a bat. It had a monkey-like face with a parrot's beak and red eyes. Now, it's reported to make a terrifying screeching noise. Miss Hartley, the poor witness to it, believed the animal could have been supernatural in nature. She stated, Although the creature looked solid, flesh and blood, and made an awful sound, I think it could be paranormal in origin, as I've never seen or read about anything that even vaguely resembles it. But if it's real, I would love to know if anyone else has seen it. In 1969, the bat-winged monkey bird was first seen by Jackie Hartley while she was travelling with her family from London to Tunbridge Wells in Kent. She said, back in 69, I was four years old and I was travelling back from my auntie's house in London. Dad had been driving for about half an hour and we were going through the countryside. I was sitting in the back of the car when I suddenly heard an awful screeching scream. Mum and Dad were in the front chatting and it appeared that they heard nothing. It was twilight, and as I looked out the back window into the trees, I saw what I could only describe as a monster. It had bat wings, which it unfolded and stretched out before folding them back up again. It had red eyes and a kind of monster monkey face with a parrot's beak, and it was about three feet in height. To my four-year-old mind, it was terrifying and I had nightmares for weeks after the event. I did not have a name for this thing in my vocabulary, so I called it the bat-winged monkey bird, as it seemed to be such a weird mixture of animals. Miss Hartley had another encounter with the bat-winged monkey bird when she was 11, and it was around 1976, and once again she was travelling through to Kent from Hastings, and she said, I saw it again late one night when I was 11. I saw it from the back window of the car on our way home from Hastings. I think we were travelling through Roberts Bridge at the time. And then, in 2006, it happened again. And she said the latest sighting was reported on the 19th, 19th, no, 19th of October. Sorry, It was 4.30 in the morning, and I was in bed. I was woken by the same horrible screeching sound that I heard the first time I'd encountered it. Thinking someone was being murdered in the street, I jumped out of bed and ran to the window, catching the tail end of it as it flew past the house. I knew immediately what it was. It was that same horrible monster that I'd seen all those years ago, the bat-winged monkey bird. Now, Roland stated that he felt that although his partner was in the room with him when his experience happened, his partner did not seem to notice the creature or his shock at seeing it. The same can be said for Jackie's parents. They seem to have been oblivious to a horrifying event with a monkey bird. It's almost like the witnesses were in a personal bubble of some kind. Only they witnessed the beast, yet the people with them did not. Now, no doubt there's some fancy word for this, or even a fancy explanation by science. But both of these witnesses are of sound mind, and as adults would surely accept any possible explanation that science had to give. Yet it's 2020, and people of the world over see these winged creatures, and no doubt they will continue to do so. But I don't see science explaining it away. Now, other winged creature reports in the UK include two couples who were hill walking back in 2017 when they made a report that they heard a terrifying experience with an odd creature which was later described as a vulture or eagle man. My brother told me that our mate had a terrifying daytime experience in the Malvern Hills area when he was with his wife and another couple. Apparently, the group were confronted by a hunched-over, large, vulture-like creature, which started to follow the group. Now, the experience was so terrifying, his wife collapsed and fainted with fear. Now, my mate's a bit of a big bloke, and he can look after himself, and he's a bit of a joker, 
So I asked him to his face about his horror story. And to my surprise, he went quite pale. I could see the terror in his face as he retold that experience. I've witnessed him telling that story on many occasions to others. And to be honest, I prompted him to try and expose it as a joke. But he stuck by it 100%. And the fear in his face is still there. He goes pale. I always expect him to say, you know, ha-ha, fooled you, something like that. But he never has. It must have had an impact on his wife as they took her to the local pub and she was out cold. The police were called, but they were not interested. I asked my friend to explain what he saw in more detail and he said, I saw the creature in the distance and went closer to it to investigate. My friends followed, but they kept the distance. As the creature came closer, he was terrified by what he saw, even more so when the creature began to move towards him. My friend ran back as fast as he could and was alarmed to see that the creature was still following from a distance, which must have seemed very close when in a state of terror. We move again to Cold Heselton and the glowing-eyed Mothman creature. On the outskirts of Seaham, on the northeast coast of England, there's a pub called the Pemberton Arms, and it's known to everybody as the White House, because for as long as any con- can remember, it's been painted white. A married couple in their early 40s, Phil and Kate, had gone to the pub on a Saturday evening, which was the 10th of October 2009, to watch a live band. Now, I don't know if the band they wanted to see had not turned up or something, but they decided to leave early, just after 10pm. And because it was unusually warm for that time of year, they walked back into town for a few jars to finish off the night. They left the pub, turned right, and walked down the lane that would lead them to the well-lit main road into town. As they got to the end of the lane, something caught their eye in the field next to the fence. At first, they thought it was a shire horse because of its size, but it was definitely not a shire horse. Phil and Kate both said it was man-shaped. It was at least seven feet tall. It was jet black with piercing red eyes. And it just stood there motionless. Phil and Kate looked at it in disbelief for about 15 seconds. Then it let out a scream like a fox before disappearing straight down like it had fell down a well or a trap door. That did it. Phil and Kate then just ran like hell onto the main road until they stopped near the recently built water treatment plant. They were exhausted and out of breath. Phil tried to phone a taxi, but found his mobile phone was completely dead, although it was working fine when they were in the pub. So half running, half walking, and constantly looking behind them, they got back home, terrified out of their wits, unable to understand what they'd just witnessed. The awful screeching scream is once again mentioned. It must be horrifying to hear that sound. Jackie heard it outside her window at home. And Phil and Kate heard the screech coming from the creature in the field. No doubt this must sound like the wail of a banshee and would be impossible to be mistaken for something well known and local to the area. The Sandlin Park Beast, sometimes called the Hive Owlman, also known as the Bat Beast of Kent. This report has a lot of names. But then get to the meat. This experience happened in Sandling Park. And it was two teenagers. And they ran from the creature when they saw it emerge from behind a tree. And to their horror, the strange creature began to approach them. It was described as shaped like a man, but it was headless, completely black in colour. It also had webbed feet and a pair of large bat-like wings. Now, prior to this creature emerging, they had all watched a mysterious light flickering about them in the sky. The two witnesses, 17-year-old John Flaxton and 18-year-old Mervyn Hutchinson, saw an unusual large glowing orb hovering high in the air. The unusual self-illuminated ovoid object which was described as being just a few metres in diameter, hovered above a field. It eventually made its way behind the trees 
and settled into the foliage of the woods at Sandlin Park. Now, while the teenager was still reeling from their astonishing sighting, something even more inconceivable would grab their attention. Moments after the extraordinary craft apparently landed behind the trees, the teens noticed a shaking in the brush, and what emerged was one of the most strangest creatures ever to have been seen. Later, horrified eyewitnesses would explain that an erratic, shambling, humanoid figure emerged from the woods and waddled towards them. It moved in a very strange way. The beast apparently looked like a headless bat that was approximately five feet tall, with large webbed feet and wings protruding from its back. In one of the witnesses' words, it didn't seem to have any head. There were just huge wings on its back like a bat. Now, less than a week later, on the 21st of November, a young man named Keith Crilcher seemed to confirm that the teen's claim was real. He said that he'd seen an unusual object soaring over Kent, and he also announced that he too had seen the oddly shaped craft hovering over the local soccer field, not far from where the boys had their curious encounter with the UFO and its bizarre occupant. Now, the next case takes us to Scotland, Glasgow, to be precise, and a strange winged figure that seemed moving at great speed, which sounds very inhuman. The Sight Hill Cemetery winged creature, and this happened in 2006, October of 2006. Firstly, I just want to make it clear, I'm not entirely sure about any of this. I consider myself to be a fairly rational type of guy. I'm certainly not prone to flights of wild fancy and hallucinations. I have, however, always had questions regarding what might be termed the supernatural. There are, after all, more things in heaven and earth and all that. But it's never been more than a passing interest for me at least until October of 2006. i just recently moved to Glasgow from Dumfries and Galloway, and I'm still getting to know the city. Last night, I couldn't sleep, something I suffer from occasionally. And so, after a lying awake for a few hours, I decided to do something useful, and instead of staring at the ceiling, we were low on milk and light bulbs, so I decided to drive to the 24-hour Tesco's not far from my flat. On the drive home, around 4.30am, and still being relatively new to the area, I missed the turn into my street, which is a cul-de-sac. And as we know, a cul-de-sac means it's just one way, shaped like a horseshoe. I pulled over, and I was just about to perform a U-turn, when something shot out of the gates on my left. Now, the gates in question are those leading into the north boundary of Sight Hill Cemetery. The thing moved extremely quickly, moving like lightning through the arc of my headlights. It shot across the nose of my car. I'd estimate around about 40 feet from me, and then it turned and travelled down the street ahead of me at an immense speed. It all happened incredibly quickly, and the whole scene was confused by the shadows and mixed lighting of street lights and car headlamps. What I did see, though, was something like a man, although I can't swear to it. It was jet black, which made it very difficult to define in the dark, and it seemed to have what might have been wings. I got the impression of what I thought were feathers, or perhaps something like bat's wings. I'm sorry I can't be more precise in my description, but this thing genuinely moved so incredibly fast. It bounded down the street and keeping for the most parts of the shadows. It seemed incredibly strong and athletic in the way it moved. I was amazed and curious, but unnerved. I put the car back into gear and I started to drive after it. I drove down the street at over 40 mile an hour and I wasn't catching this thing. It was now around about 100 yards or so ahead of me. And as we approached a set of traffic lights... The thing lurched away to the right. So I swung the car after it and I pursued it down the street. Conditions, however, were even worse here. There were fewer streetlights and much more cover for it to hide. 
This thing flickered back into view a few times, bounding and running on the road ahead of me. But soon I lost it in the dark. I slowed the car down. I was doing well over 50 mile an hour at that point, And I just carried on driving. I was scanning the road ahead for a sign of this thing the whole time. I'd almost given up when I saw it again on the pavement at the left of the road, about 200 yards ahead of me. This time, it was standing stock still, though it was still too distant for me to make out any details. Though standing still, it certainly seemed to be man-like. Possibly a guy wearing a heavy cowl that may have been mistaken for wings, I'm just not sure. I continued to close the distance between us, very slowly now, and for some reason, I got the impression that that thing, whatever it was, was curious about me. It seemed to be regarding me as I drove towards it. Then something even more incredible occurred. The thing suddenly jumped straight up in the air and cleared the fence next to the pavement in a single movement, disappearing over the other side of it. This, it turned out, was the retaining wall for Ashfield Speedway. And it was a good 20 feet in height. I got out of the car and looked through a gap in the fence into the interior of the speedway, but there was no sign of it. I hung around for about 15 minutes, but I saw nothing. So I drove home. I still have precisely zero idea what it might have been. I only know what I saw. The whole episode only took a few minutes, but even now it seems impossible. Whoever, or whatever it was, it was capable of fantastic speed and was inhumanly agile. It cleared a 20 feet wall from standing in one go. This thing was incredible. Now to me, my humble opinion, these creatures sound almost like the gargoyles of old. Often seen crouched with wings and the most ugliest of faces that you can imagine. They're normally found high up on the eaves of stately homes and churches. They are said to ward off evil from anything that they're protecting. They're staunch guardians who will fight to the death any man who crosses them. I have no doubt there will be historical reports of these winged beings in old texts and dusty libraries across the country. Whether summoned here or here of their own free will, <clears throat> people who experience them may be holding a secret, sometimes for generations within families. Have you heard of anything that sounds like this? Keep an eye on the rooftops or high in the trees as you take the dog out for a walk or enjoy a cigarette at the bedroom window. And those are just the creatures you can see. As you know, here at BBR, we look into the phenomena ordinary people are faced with every day. We try to help them share their experience amongst friends and people who will understand how they feel. The cases that come in range from cryptid or paranormal creatures, unknown humanoids, all the way through to UFO and abduction events. We deal with the paranormal, supernatural or otherworldly subjects. We investigate missing time events, animal mutilations, strange or mysterious disappearances. Over the years, we've taken thousands of sighting accounts and witness interviews. For each witness, the event is a personal experience that they are often sharing for the first time, outside of the small circle of friends. For others, it's still a well-kept secret being shared for the first time. Viewing a spirit or a ghost is not seen as unusual by modern-day society. But seeing something not known to science can hinder the progress of anyone trying to come to terms with a singular event or a lifetime of experiences. Tonight you will hear from people who were shadowed by an unseen being, something unnamed while out in the woods. These people are not alone in their experience. Events exactly like this happen all across the UK and worldwide. These reports are just a selection 
of events that have happened that have come in and been reported. The River Ouse and the secrets it holds, shadowed by an unseen and sheep taken by an unknown predator. As most of our regular readers and listeners will know, the rivers that flow in the UK have a number of strange experiences in the towns and villages along them. These include all kind of impossible events and extraordinary circumstances like paranormal reports, cryptid UFO events, and the River Ouse is no exception. The Little Ouse and the Great Ouse are connected and they're enjoyed by thousands of leisure seekers. A number of years ago, I received a report from a wild camper who experienced a really strange night camping along the Ouse and then quite recently came in a report from a lady named Sarah who also had a strange experience when staying overnight at the Matchstick Camp which is situated right on the banks of the river and it's in a wild and beautiful area. I'll share Sarah's experience with you and also we can look at some of the other reports that have taken place. The images you see, the nature images, were provided by Sarah and I've used them with her permission. The black shuck ones, obviously, have been taken from Google Free Images. Sarah and her partner live my dream life. They travel and live in a converted van, which enables them a vast amount of freedom and they have travelled to some of nature's gems here in the UK. As van living or weekending is becoming very popular here, I feel that there will be other people who will see or experience something strange whilst parked up in our national parks or our green spaces. So many creatures, ghosts and UFOs are seen by drivers on the road. Imagine living in a place with no light sources out in the wilds of Snowdonia or on an icy gravel road in the Highlands. All those things I would love to do. But knowing what I know, I will view the woodlands, mountain ranges, valleys and moorlands in a different way to your average Brit. I think it's the same for Sarah too. When you experience something you can't explain, it's not easy to put it to the back of your mind or forget it. Here's Sarah's report in her own words. Hi Deborah, I finally decided to contact you with a couple of accounts, one of which I know you'll find interesting. The first strange event that happened happened at Matchstick Wood, which is a free wild camping site on the outskirts of Bedford, just off a tributary to the Great Ouse. The site consists of a number of named clearings set amongst predominantly ash woodland and there's a covered pallet area by each clearing for stacking and storing firewood as well as a couple of composting toilets near each section. In August of 2018, myself and my husband and our friend had kayaked all day starting at Bromham Mill the other side of Bedford Town, and in May Camp, we had hammocks and tarps, just as it was getting dark and beginning to rain. There was no one else using the campsite, so we had our choice of all of the clearings. We had our dinner, and a friend and his two kids visited later in the evening, bringing plenty of very welcome marshmallows to toast on our fire. And they went home after enjoying a couple of hours of the camping experience. They were all a little spooked by the darkness around. There's no lighting out there. But then they're not particularly used to country life or camping like we are. Whilst guiding them in and out of the woodland, my husband noticed a surprising amount of eye shine from the trees around picking up in the light of his torch. He said he saw at least one small cat and put the rest down to being likely deer. We thought it was pretty cool as we're keen on wildlife and nature. Myself and my husband had spent quite a bit of time out and about, including wild camping on Dartmoor. I grew up in the countryside, tending our horses in the blackest of nights and very rarely use a torch if I need to pop outside at night. I've often been asked if I get scared when I'm out in the wilderness and I can honestly say that the dark has never been an issue for me. That's where this trip became a peculiar experience. While okay earlier on, I got the heaviest sinking feeling of dread when I left the fire for the last time before we went to bed down. 
sometime around midnight. As I picked my way along the dark pathway between the camps to choose a toilet to use, I got that familiar prickling sensation like I was being watched by someone and that I was in danger, though I heard nothing. I should add that in the past, I relied on my intuition to get me out of more than one potential assault scenario. Getting the urge to leave a place and then being approached by suspicious men with suspicious reasons for being there. I think most women, unfortunately, have a story like that in their experience. I suddenly realised just how isolated I was. I was away from any protection the guys could give me and I got really spooked. Despite being a strong woman and well-trained in self-defence, I just didn't feel right. The thought crossed my mind that if anything sinister had been watching us that night, this was their moment to strike and it just felt like I'd made a very grave mistake. I tried my hardest to calm my nerves, telling myself I was just a silly thought, but I stayed on high alert all the time. I was scanning the trees systematically back and forth the entire time with my head torch on. Whilst I relieved myself, I never took my eyes off the trees. I was fully expecting to see something or someone sneaking up on me. I considered calling out to my husband and our friend, but I also worried that making noise could force whoever it was to make a move or the sound could mask their approach, so I stayed silent. As soon as I finished, I started walking back well, crashing back through the undergrowth before even properly pulling up my trousers. I was that eager to get out of there. Because it was late, we'd allowed the fire to die right down, which meant that for a few sickening seconds, I couldn't see any light from the fire or a straight route back to our clearing. Finally, I recognised a path and found my way back to safety. The guys were amused because they'd seen my torchlight zigzagging all over the place through the trees and knew I'd got lost. I left it off, although I did admit that I'd gotten myself a bit creeped out and we all wriggled into our individual sleeping bags and hammocks, swaying ourselves to sleep to the gentle tap of the rain on our taps. In the morning, our friend and my husband reported hearing what they assumed to be a deer what really close to their tarps during the night, which they agreed was a bit creeper, had they not figured it to be a harmless day, which in all likelihood it probably was. We busied ourselves making breakfast and relaxed until the afternoon, packing camp up at a leisurely pace before relaunching our kayaks to paddle the short distance to the Danish camp, which is a local riverside cafe, where we'd left our vehicle. Since nothing of note really happened, I put the previous night out of my mind until hearing other people's stories of that being watched sensation as well as reading some disturbing news of slaughtered livestock from very close to that section of the river. I saved a Facebook post um, from September and the report had the following. My wife Teresa Young, who is from Great Barford, last night lost nine prime lambs to some vile individual who thought it appropriate to slaughter and butcher them in the field they grazed in. This is between Great Barford and Willington. This is the second time this year we've been targeted with devastating consequences. Please share and be vigilant. We've just been informed that a similar incident happened last night also in the area between Wellingborough on Wollaston. Also, 11 lambs are still missing after being taken from between Wellington and Wollaston. Wollaston Lake, someone wrote, the little field on the cycle route just after the bridge as you go through. Do you mean there? Is that the same one that it happened in before? And someone answers, yes, it's the same one, just a different field. Another person commented, A friend lost a couple of pet goats in the same way near to the Danish camp in Willington. After all I've read and heard, I have to wonder if the cases really are incidents of people with butcher knives poaching free meat or something else entirely. Sarah added, 
The annoying thing is, I'll never know if that night was just my mind playing tricks on me or if there really was some sinister threat to my life, human or otherwise. Another afterthought I've had, after hearing some interesting Bigfoot dogman stories, is that the entire time I was scanning the trees around me, I never once thought to look up. I dread think what might have been right there, above me, if I'd done so. He said, no, the campsite itself is picked clean of fallen wood since it's high demand for the fires. But on the other side of the main woodland pathway, there's a gloomy area of dense pine plantation, which on investigating the day before, in preparation for our stay, it had lots of branches stacked like teepee shelters. I'd always figured it was where kids had been playing at bushcraft, but I would like another look after reading about Bigfoot structures. The woodland makes for an ideal spot to stay if you were following the course of the river. And Sarah went on to say, the second event happened to my husband and it involved something unseen crashing through the woods which seemed to follow him. It happened last year in 2019 on a trip to North Wales. We parked for the night in our van, which is our full-time home. We stopped in a forestry plantation, car park, high up on a remote mountain. I think the closest town or village was Clanderfell. As it was just starting to get dark, my husband decided to take his folding shovel on a short walk to answer a call of nature. Once he'd done his business, he had a little explore of the trails around the car park, which he would normally do, and he was jogging, which is normal for him as well. He'd gone only about 100 metres or so in when he became aware of something crashing through the thick undergrowth off to one side of him. At first, he thought it was a weird trick of echo, as when he stopped, so did the noise. He stamped heavily several times to test the sound, and he didn't hear anything bounce back. When he started jogging back towards the van, the noise started up again. The noisemaker was out of sight, but close by, and they were keeping perfectly in pace with him. He was a little confused and unnerved by this, as we're used to encountering deer, etc. But they always run away, and they never follow alongside us. This was out of the ordinary for any native animal. I don't know how he was able to keep his cool, but he did. He just stated that since running seemed to set it off, he decided to slow down and walk back to the van instead. And clearly that was a good decision, as he returned to tell the tale. I was preparing dinner when he got back, and he asked me jokingly if I'd brought us to another bloody dogman place again, which he doesn't quite buy into the stories of, you know, perhaps really wants to know about the things that I like. He's heard enough, and comically, we've visited a lot of places in the past, only to late to hear terrifying accounts from the area we'd stayed in. So I just laughed and replied, oh, they're everywhere, before I saw his expression, and I said, wait, what, why? And he told me what had just happened. I was tempted to go outside and try some whooping or wood knocking, etc., to see if we'd get a response. But I admit I chicken out because I didn't want to deal with the consequences of getting an answer. We decided to stay the night since, despite the creepy experience beyond the car park, the spot itself didn't seem to have any negative vibes. Plus it had taken a while to find a suitable camping spot. And in all, we just went on to enjoy a very pleasant holiday. Regards. Sarah. Now we've heard this shadowing style before from many other witnesses. Sometimes you can hear it as you walk. It stops when you stop and it walks when you walk. It keeps up with you as you move along the path. But this does it through the thick brush and undergrowth. An unseen stalker easily keeping pace with you using the woodlands along the river course to conceal and hide itself. A very rare few humans have the dubious pleasure of meeting them. Now, we don't have to follow the river's course far before we see our next report. Invisible monkeys. You could see the tree moving, but not what was moving it. 
Andy is a driver who drives the roads of the UK. On a number of deliveries, he saw something impossible that he couldn't explain. He likened it to the Predator movie. Andy saw something moving up the trunk of a tree, but whenever he saw, it seemed to cloak itself in some way. After the first event, he repeated the journey in the hopes of finding an explanation, and on a number of occasions he saw it again. Seeing a creature can be terrifying and a confusing event. Seeing something in stealth mode moving through the trees is impossible to describe. How do you put into words the prismatic thing before your eyes? It looks like it's reflecting the light or mirroring its surroundings in some way. As Andy was driving to work early one morning, he saw what he described as a movement of energy, something similar to the invisible predator in the film. A swirling, moving enigma. Andy did a double take. He looked again and they were still there. They went up the tree like invisible monkeys. And those are his words, not mine. The next day, Andy took the same route to make sure the event and the moving figures he saw was not a reflection or a trick of the light. But it wasn't. There was no reflection or anything he could have confused with them at all. Puzzled and none the wiser, Andy drove on. A few mornings later, he saw the same prismatic energy moving back up the same tree. One other point to note is that Andy lived in a rural area and one morning when he was getting dressed, both he and his girlfriend heard a deep, heavy breathing right up close to their bedroom window. Now, I cannot talk about the use without mentioning Thetford Forest and the many strange reports that come from there. The Thetford walking bear, the Thetford baboon, the hairy upright thing, to name a few. The next reports took place very close to the river and they are within the forest itself. I was being shadowed by something I could not see. A gentleman contacted me on YouTube after seeing an earlier video I'd made about the strange clusters of accounts in the Thetford Forest area. He watched the video and he was reminded of something similar that happened to him in the same area as the earlier accounts that could possibly be connected. I live in Thetford Forest, very near to the other Thetford sightings, and I've seen some rather strange things whilst out walking in the woods there. Once, a few years ago, I was out walking and I had the feeling that I was not alone and that I was being stalked and I couldn't shake it. I felt that wherever it was, it was keeping up with me and watching me from in the bushes. It could see me, but I could not see it. I realised that in the high shrubs and grass, something was moving alongside me and keeping up step for step. No matter how hard I looked, I could not see or make out what it was. The bracken and underbrush had grown so high that year due to the heavy rainfall in the spring that whatever was moving alongside me was completely shrouded. The scrub and brush was around chest height and something quite large was moving through it. It was close by to me and making pace without too much trouble. It was keeping pace with me on the path as I walked. He kept stopping when I did, and then as I began walking again, I'd hear it walking again. It did the same exact thing I did, and I could hear it following me. Now I know of many animals in the area, but I don't know what this could have been, as it didn't hide or move off like most animals would. This is not the behaviour of a deer. They would turn tail and run if they were spotted. In fact, most times they move off before you even notice them. I'm used to being out here and it wasn't anything like that. It felt like whatever it was, it knew I was there and it didn't care for it. It paced out my steps with me as I walked along, moving me away from the area. It was more than unnerving. Luckily, I was near my home and I legged it out of there as fast as I could. I kept looking back to see if whatever it was would emerge from the tree line. But thankfully, 
it didn't. The figure crossing the lane. I live quite close to Thetford Forest and have, over a number of years, had a couple of strange experiences while out in the forest itself, and I wanted to share them with you. My first experience, or the first thing that happened to me, happened when I stayed outdoors overnight by the river Little Oofs with a friend. We canoed upstream from Stanton Downham until we reached the Weir and River Gaging Station. We drifted back downstream a little to a suitable location to pull the canoe out of the water and we wanted an area with suitable trees to set up the hammocks for the night. We walked until we were far, far off the beaten track and decided we'd set up camp for the night in the spot we'd found. It was about 2am when we settled in to our hammocks to get some sleep. Nothing was moving, everything was quiet for a while, until we both heard a slow and deliberate movement that approached us. We both asked each other at the same time, Is that you? And we both answered, No, I thought it was you. We remained silent and the sound of footsteps circled us before slowly walking away from our direction. Whatever it was, it would pause if we made any kind of noise and then start up again if we were quiet. In the first light, we could clearly see the trampled down tall grass and the root, whatever it was, took around us before returning to continue with its walk along the river bank. There is no path along the river where we stayed, only tall grass and very vicious stinging nettles that could sting through your jeans. It was all really strange. Someone had walked up to camp and walked slowly around the hammocks with enough noise that we could hear them and then off again along the river. As we paddled back in the morning, we went over what we'd seen and we... what we'd seen, what we'd heard, we were discussing it and trying to work it out. What was it? Who was it? Who could it have been? It could have been a person, I suppose, but I find it strange that they'd be walking along an overgrown riverbank in the dead of night, no torch or light to guide them, he said. How did they manage not to trip over and fall in the river or not react to being stung by the nettles? The only thing we could think of was it had to walk upright on two legs. This is based on the sound of the footsteps and the tracks in the long grass and nettles. Plus, I have good night vision and we were very aware of our surroundings. I don't think either of us wanted to say exactly what we thought it could have been, in case it put either of us off bushcrafting in the forest. Neither of us felt scared or unsettled at any time, while whatever it was investigated our camp. And then the second account happened on Sunday morning, 25th of June, 2017. I got up early and I decided to take my dog for a good long walk through the forest. I parked my car down a forest track that has the right of way with vehicles are permitted. We set off as normal, birds were singing, cool air with a warmth for the sun. My dog normally walks about two or three metres out in front when she's off the lead. She does seem to think that all creatures in the forest are potential play friends. She's also friendly to, you know, other people and dogs. She'll bark and yap excitedly to engage the other dog in a chase me game. I'd like to think I know her barks and their meanings quite well by now. The walk went well, nothing out of the ordinary. We go by a potential overnight bushcraft location and I see a woven willow hazel screen that's been erected at a spot that overlooks the railway line and the Little Loose River. The screen had about four rectangular apertures at various heights, as if for binoculars to be used. It's too far off the beaten track and the mark trails to be for your average visitor. The grass was not trodden down near it, though, so it's not been used too much to share. We carried on and took a shortcut back to the car. I put the travel harness on the dog and I clip her in. I start the car and I slowly head back down the track to go out of the forest. I've got the windows down to enjoy the breeze and smile at my dog and watching her with her head out of the window. And all of a sudden, her head appears between the two front seats and she's staring at something ahead. Nothing I say or do will break her stare, so I begin to scan the track and the verge ahead for a person, a dog or a deer. I'm aware she has now stood up 
and he's leaning forward as if to get a better look or to be in the front. I can't see anything out of place up the track ahead of us, but I do slow down to a crawl just in case something should run out in front of the car. All of a sudden she starts barking on full volume and this is not her greeting bark. It's so much more deeper and powerful. In between each bark she now growls and her top lip is curled back, she's showing her teeth. In the five years I've owned her, she has never ever displayed this behaviour. I stop the car, I try to calm her down and reassure her that everything's okay. She does all she can to keep looking ahead. She's snarling and growling and deep, powerful barks. I like to think I know my dog well, but this unsettled me a little. I decided to carry on driving in the hope of passing whatever it was that was causing her to be agitated. But by now she's pulling against her harness and I have never heard the sound she's making before. I have also never seen her so agitated and focused on what she decided was a threat. I kept scanning the track ahead and verges, but I just couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. As I'm driving, I try to keep an eye on her and try and see her turn and face whatever it is when we pass by. But I also have one eye on the track ahead. And for a moment, I considered turning the car around and leaving the forest via the long way out just to avoid whatever is the cause of this agitation. And then I see something. Up ahead, coming out of the verge of tall grasses and bracken and nettle, is something moving from the left to the right. Its movement looked fluid and deliberate. My first thought was that it was a vehicle of some type. But the idea is quickly dismissed. And how would it fit through the trees? What would it be? Before I can get a better look, it's crossed a track and I could no longer see it. I didn't get a chance to have a good look and see detail because of the distance and the speed it crossed the track. It was a grey brown in colour, no sharp defined outline such as a vehicle. My mind's trying to match the image of what it could be. My dog's still growling and snarling and barking. And as we passed the spot where it crossed, I could see a parting of the branches and the grass, but not like a deer trail that's clearly defined. My dog's, dog's now facing the way the creature has gone. The rackles are up, and snarling and growling and deep barking and in a wide, defensive stance. She then faces out the rear, still barking, until we got onto the main road and head home. I still have no idea what crossed that path and upset the dog so much, but she has never acted this way before. I wondered if there were any strange sheep kills other than the ones mentioned by Sarah earlier on, and I wasn't disappointed actually when I looked. There was five sheep found dead in a field slaughter, and it says five sheep have died following a brutal attack on livestock near Thetford. Police received a call at 11.40 in the morning to farmland on Ovington Road off Clay Road following a report that two sheep had been found dead in the field. The farmer also found that three other sheep had sustained injuries so severe that they had to be put down by a vet. Inquiries by the police and the RSPCA indicate that the attack was possibly committed by an unknown animal. The Thetford Forest Park Creature Sighting, 2009. Myself and my friend had been camping the night before in one of the woodlands just a little way out of the forest. We got up early at first light. We packed up our gear and we were on the move just after sunrise. As we strolled along through the forest, my mate suddenly stopped and said, Can you see that? I looked over to where he was pointing and I saw something looking back at us across the clearing. It was just watching us. I would say it stood about seven foot tall, and all I can describe it as is it was not of this world. I'm getting goosebumps while I'm writing this. We sort of calmly walked off at a very fast pace without looking back, and to be honest, I sometimes get the creeps when I'm camping out at night, when remembering that experience. Fire Road 23, a very nasty, low, throaty growl. On the 23rd of the 7th, 2019, a witness reported I had a strange experience in Thetford Forest, Norfolk. 
I was with a group of people in a quiet part of the woods. We were walking on a dark and dirt track. Everything was fine at first, but when we reached a section of the path, there came a very nasty, low, throaty growl. The growl was far too heavy duty for any domestic dog. We were on a dirt road known as Forest Track 23. The track is split by two with the campsite road and we were at the very furthest north section of the woods, which is about half a mile from St Helens campsite, which just sits over the country border rail track kind of in Suffolk. And the Eve Dill Baboon. This happened in 2011. A witness made a report on the 19th of May 2011 and he was a driver whose route ran through the forest. He reported seeing a hairy, light grey creature which was down on all fours, moving through the grass around 90 metres away from him. The driver could see the creature had forward-facing eyes, a long snout and upright ears on its head. The creature then stood on its hind legs and approached the driver and it was moving like an ape before it then dropped down once again to all fours and was last seen running off, peering over its shoulder as it left. So something is moving around out there and being seen. No matter where you are in Norfolk, there will be a strange shook story held within the family. A bungay or a padfoot seen by a relative out in the lanes and farms and fields. Those stories have been coming in for generations. A driver seems a foaming wolf, 2006. A driver, on his way back from a cinema in Norwich, encountered a large black wolf eating a carcass along a road. The creature was described as standing around a metre at the withers, with yellow eyes and black matted hair. The driver slowed, and the wolf briefly looked up before continuing to eat. The witness continued home shaking.